Welcome to the Public Sector Marketing Show, a podcast for government and public sector marketing professionals who want to level up their digital marketing and social media knowledge, skills, and strategic thinking. And now, welcome your host, Joanne Sweeney. Hello and welcome to episode 40 of the Public Sector Marketing Show. It's that time of year where I share my social media predictions. Now, some people get nervous about sharing their predictions, but not me. I base my opinions on hundreds of hours of practice throughout the year, coupled with working with public sector marketing professionals, understanding their challenges and forecasting their results. So coming up in today's show, Are you a savvy social media public sector pro? Find out. 10 social media predictions for public sector. We end the year looking at the state of social media with Andy Lambert of Content Cal. Find out what's trending right now and what you should be taking into your 2022 plan. And speaking of 2022 social media plans, find out more about my free webinar in January. Coming up in today's column, I asked the question, are you a savvy social media pro? Well, 2021 was the year that you scaled the fence of social media and you truly leaned into it. Yes, of course, that came with COVID-19 and the obligation to be exclusively online when we were still very much restricted with in-person communications and in-person events. So I want to think about how you can become the best social media pro that you can be by kind of posing some questions and also sharing sharing what the best social media pros are doing right now. So the first thing that I would say is that a great social media pro is responsible for strategy. Now, you may never have written your organizations or your department's social media strategy before, but I'm working with lots of public sector professionals who are keen and eager to actually take on that task. The reason that they are is twofold. Number one, they want to gain the skill set of understanding social media strategy and not just doing social media for social media's sake. The second reason is that they're keen to progress up their career ladder. It's not enough right now, if you are ambitious, to just understand how to post on social media, how to use the features. You really want to lean into your critical thinking and have that strategic oversight of why we apply specific social media tactics to specific channels. So a great social media pro will be very keen and will action a social media strategy. The second characteristic that I would say is a fondness and a respect for insights. And I have a show coming up this month on the whole topic of data insights. And you really will be keen to understand what those insights are doing and giving you in terms of social media insight. Because guess what? All of the answers to all of your social media questions are deep in that data. And so when a social media pro is savvy, they are looking into the data and they are taking out and interpreting all of the stories that the data is telling us and then they are putting it into their plan. They're also influencing up to their senior line manager and sharing the data with them. So that's number two when it comes to insights and data. Number three, another characteristic of a great social media pro is they are a social media influencer within their own organization. Now, what do I mean by that? I don't mean that they're raising their profile publicly and gaining all these likes and all these Instagram followers. What I mean is that they are gaining traction and influencing among their peers internally within the organization. They are impressing on the importance and why social media should be prioritized based on the strategy that they've done, based on the data that they've gleaned from their insights. And so they're very much listened to, but they're also heard, and then their calls to action are responded to. So perhaps that is you. So finally, and number four, another great characteristic of a social media pro that is highly savvy is somebody that has a true vision for content that aligns with public need. I had a conversation this week at work and um, time is always a problem for public sector professionals, especially in small teams when social media isn't their only job. 
And the kind of pushback that I got was, you know, content is great and planning content is great, but we just don't have time. We operate, operate in the moment and in the now. But a savvy social media pro will not act like that. They will understand that planning and forward planning your content and understanding where the public are right now by doing social listening is the way forward in terms of developing a social media plan that gets you results. So hopefully that has given you some food for thought and perhaps you can let me know if you think you are a savvy social media pro. Send me a tweet to at JS Tweets Digital. Level up your digital skills by taking our diploma in digital marketing plus gain an industry qualification. Use the code Digital Marketing 20 for a 20% discount. Visit publicsectormarketingpros.com. It's time now for today's consulting segment, and I am going to share with you my 2022 social media predictions for public sector. And first on the list is Real Talk on Reels. And what I mean by that is I would love to see public sector pros and organizations lean into more authentic content. I feel that in 2021, there was a lot of marketing and push messaging across the social networks. And I get that as you scramble to engage the public amidst the pandemic and the ever-changing environment and public health regulations. But I think we need to change gear. And I would really love to see you lean into all of that great content and the stories and the people that you have within the organization because we want to shift from marketing messages to public interest messages and that can come from the inside. So the second prediction that I'm making is it's time to TikTok. A year ago, I said, you know, pause, wait, let's see how TikTok evolves and perhaps you're not ready and I wouldn't push you into TikTok. But we've seen the explosion of TikTok this year. It really is commanding massive share of the social media space. And in fact, you know it's winning when the other social networks are trying to emulate and catch up. We saw that Instagram redesigned its app interface on mobile and it put Reels front and centre. So I really genuinely think that it's time for government and public sector to TikTok in 2022. The third prediction that I'm making is community is king. The noise on social media is making it even more difficult for public sector to get close to the public on social. So how do we circumvent that? We circumvent that by creating niche communities. We'll hear from Andy Lambert a little bit later and he'll tell us that organic reach and engagement is continuing to fall. And so if you continue to engage in mass messaging to a mass market, then you are going to struggle to make any real impact on social. We've seen how Facebook is evolving Facebook groups. Now within Facebook groups, you can have subgroups. So that will allow public sector organizations to go niche. So I want you to think about community in 2022. Trend number four is on the back of COVID and also the explosion of messaging. So messaging on Facebook, messaging on WhatsApp, and indeed across the other social networks. I had a public sector pro this week tell me that, you know, we can't possibly engage in messaging because it's, it's not secure. There might be privacy issues. Whereas... You know, my response to that, and in a very kind way, is we can no longer dictate how we communicate with the public in the digital age. We need to be agile and we need to respond to how the public want to hear from us. So WhatsApp and Messenger is two key platforms. It needs to be embedded into your social media plan in 2022. Okay, let's go to number five, and you're going to have to continue to pay to play with the increasing drop in organic reach and engagement. You're going to have to bring a paid strategy into play, and you will get your ROI if you test and if you iterate based on what you learn from your advertising. So get a ring fence budget for social next year. 
Number six is all about influencer marketing. And I've actually got a webinar in conjunction with Irish Blogger Agency coming up and you can catch the replay if you can't make it live. And I am going to work on developing a, a framework and a style of influencer marketing for public sector. And this will help you to build your communities and your niche audiences. Number seven is around social media and scaling social media up in 2022. We can't leave it to the comms department anymore. I am getting huge frustration with from public sector pros who were saying to me, you know, Joanne, social media wasn't even in my original job spec. It's not in my current job spec, but yet social media has been layered upon my job role and there's a massive expectation for results, but it's not resourced in terms of time, training, or indeed an advertising budget. So I think it's time for HR to step into the breach and to really look at how they're expecting staff to manage social media, learn social media, get results from social media, when really it's not front and center of their job spec. Number eight then, content marketing planning. I mentioned it uh, in my previous column, and I really do think that there's gotta be more emphasis on planning out your content. The 70-30 rule is one that I espouse for public sector marketing. 70% of your content can be planned, 30% can be done in the now. But I'm finding that not a lot of planning is happening, and there's an over-reliance on now social media posting. Okay, number nine, I want to pitch to you that 2022 should be, and I hope to see, the rise of the show. Yes, I am encouraging public sector marketing organizations, government agencies, government departments, public figures, charities, and nonprofits to step in and to turn on the lights, the camera, and get on the stage and create their own show. This is owned media. A couple of shows back, I talked about marketing in a cookie-less world. What you need to do, what all of us need to do is that we need to create really high quality, high value owned content that we create that has legacy value that we can embed on our website and that we can cross promote and repurpose. So consider having your own show. It can be a social media show, it can be a podcast, it can be on YouTube, it can be whatever you want. But that owned content and framing it as a social media show, I think would stand you in good stead. Okay, the final prediction for 2022 is, no surprise, it's social audio. So Clubhouse versioned up this year. We saw Twitter introducing spaces, Facebook introduced rooms, and also Facebook podcasts, and that is just the rise of social audio, where we can listen as we go. We know that podcasts are growing in consumption and people love podcasts, but really social audio can now play a part and it can help you reach more people if you've got a podcast and if you don't, maybe it's time to start thinking about it. So there are my 10 social media predictions for public sector for 2022. I'd be really keen to hear from you on what you think is your top prediction from that list. Send me a tweet to at JS Tweets Digital. A one-stop shop digital marketing and social media resource. Join our membership academy for 12 months. Access a library of how-to videos, template strategies, and organizational policies. Monthly live coaching. Attend webinars with subject matter experts. Meet and network with public sector pros from across the world. Use the code MEMBERSHIP20 for a 20% discount. Visit publicsectormarketingpros.com. So it's time for this week's interview and I'm delighted to have Andy Lambert from Content Cal on. So as you may know, Andy and I host the monthly social media news show. So I've decided to take this into the public sector marketing show because it will help frame your thinking of where social media is at. It's so difficult to keep up with all the platform changes every month. So we do it in our social media news show. So this will help you understand where social media is at right now I've given you my predictions for 2022. The rest is over to you. Hi, Andy. Great to see you. I haven't seen you since the Public Sector Digital Marketing Summit and your epic update. How have you been? 
Uh, very well, thank you. Yeah, I've missed you, Joanne. So it's good to be back doing this. How are you? I'm really well. And listen, we're coming to the end of the year, right? And already people are talking about 2022 social media trends. But I think we need to wrap up the year with where we are right now. So I'm going to hand over my stage to you. So off you go and fill us in. Let's do it. So this is a, the final one of the year. So it's, um yeah, it's been quite a year uh, this year. So let's go ahead and and share and dive straight into it. So as we always do, if you tuned into these before, um, go in a couple of ways where firstly, we start with the trends, the things that we notice some data as well. Then we're going to go into the specific network by network updates and all the things that they're changing. And we'll conclude with some of the kind of takeaways, actions and the, the trends that we'll see continuing into 2022. But as I always caveat these sessions with is like, consider this, um, a way of giving all of the context on what's happening in the world of social. Don't think by any means that you need to be doing all of the things that are happening here. Hopefully this gives you just like the inspiration to build and develop your strategies into 2022. But don't feel like you need to be doing everything because always doing fewer things well is better than doing lots of things badly, as we all know. So let's dive into it. Um, just by a way of a quick introduction, I'm Andy, I'm from Content Cal. This is what Content Cal looks like, content planning software, but that's enough of that. Let's go straight into the trends. Firstly, Gen Z social platform usage. I wanted to share this because it's one, it's brand new data and you can see the source at the bottom of these charts is that, you know, whilst many of us won't necessarily be targeting, you know, ages 12 to 17, it's kind of interesting that we're looking at this because 13 is the the age that users should really be joining social media but hey let's ignore that for a moment but what it does do is is chart the trend as to what's happening with this demographic because it really does help us understand the future of social and where it's going as we can see um we've got kind of some polar opposite trends going on where we've got instagram going down a little bit so from 2019 to 21 we've got snapchat staying you know about consistent, I would say, you know, dropped a little bit from 2019, but holding consistent at 54%. And then, of course, we've got TikTok from nowhere to being the platform of choice. So clearly, once again, another bit of data that demonstrates TikTok's meteoric rise. But the other thing that's experiencing a meteoric rise, and whilst this won't necessarily affect a uh, public sector in terms of how you'll be using social, but it will affect the usage of social, which means more people spending more time on the platform, which is incredibly important when we consider our strategies for how we build our communities. So really, this is only going to go one way, which is more people spending more time on the platforms. But this e-commerce thing, this social commerce, as it's becoming known of, is, is such an important trend that's defining and driving so many of these changes that we're going to see over the course of this update. In China, where these trends typically start from, it's now a $436 billion industry on track to hit 80 billion in the US and the UK will be following suit. Simply put, social media platforms are going after Amazon for their monopoly over the e-commerce space and they're building tools faster than they can get them out um, for tools to help facilitate this. So you're going to see this pretty much underpinning a lot of social media direction into 2022. But something that I think everyone on this session will like will be some of these organic and paid trends, because this will impact us from a public sector perspective. And here, let's start with the gap between Facebook and Instagram. As we reported a couple of months back, there's about a six times difference between the engagement that you get on Facebook versus Instagram so in the favor of Instagram. So if you want organic engagement, engagement being like shares, comments, etc., Instagram is, is the place to place it. Doesn't mean Facebook should be removed from our strategy whatsoever, we, but we just need to be cognizant of the fact that Facebook, certainly from a pages perspective, is challenging to drive that growth. But the thing that kind of underpins this a little bit, which is something that isn't great news, but it is worth us all thinking about, is the fact if we look at 2020 to 21, you'll notice that there's a drop in overall interactions. So interactions meaning the same as engagement. So that really is kind of, giving us the clue that organic reach and organic interaction and engagement is dropping both on Facebook and Instagram, even though Instagram will be still more generous from an organic perspective. So we do need to be mindful of that in our strategies where if we're looking to increase our reach significantly into next year, we need to be thinking about bringing new platforms into the mix. So 
Live video on Facebook, seeing three times engagement. I reported this in the Public Sector Dig Digital Summit. This has been a trend that's pretty much been very consistent over the course of this year. And this is just some other data that further demonstrates that. Live stream video, the most top performing content format on Facebook. As you can see, it pretty much nearly triples the next highest content, highest performing content format, which is photo posts, then video, then link and, and beyond. So also goes to show that don't always think that it's all about video as well, because actually in the feed, um, photo posts, single photo posts perform better than a video. So sometimes video posts aren't always worth the in extra investment in creation as it might seem. So it's not all about video quite yet, as this data would show. Interestingly, fewer businesses are going live on Facebook as well. So it shows there's a bit of a disconnect happening between organic strategies and what's happening on a platform, which is something very interesting to note and maybe think about going into next year. Link posts tend not to do very well on Facebook, but we've never really had the data to absolutely prove it out. So whenever you're adding a link on a Facebook post, it's halving the engagement rate. This is some really good data from Social Insider. And here, what we're looking at across each of the content formats, the impact of the post decreased substantially. So, but here we can see reiterating that, that point where um, album posts, i.e. carousels, perform the best, photos slightly behind, behind that, single image, and then video as well. So flipping over to Instagram, we'll see that Instagram, if we look at the different content formats that people are posting, we'll see a similar trend as well. So firstly, if we have a look at like performance side of things, we'll see that this, this denotes the frequency that people are posting the content in these certain formats. You'll see a growth of carousel is the main core thing to notice here. But underneath that, however, is you can see the top performing post formats where carousel, multi-image, so the, the album posts as we saw on Facebook are the ones that are doing the best because fundamentally they offer a couple of bites of the cherry, so to speak, as to help you drive engagement where different images are shown. So carousel, best performing content type on Instagram. So that's the one that's driving most of the growth right now. And, and similar to that, we can see image posts performing well. Um, and then video is actually one of the lowest performing post formats. And that's specifically video in the feed. Instagram TV, that will become slightly more relevant as time goes on. It will just become rebranded as something else because Insta Instagram are changing their video strategy away from Instagram TV. So let's let's have a look at stories. So stories is a is a really interesting one to look at because if we have a look at the account size, if you think about your Instagram account size, you'll see that in the metric on the left hand side. So if you look at the Instagram story performance, you'll see that the amount of stories created per month uh, per account. You'll see, you know, if you're north of 100,000 followers, which not many of us are, to be fair, um, 49 stories a month, quite a lot, but naturally there's quite an engaged audience to, to build there. But the more interesting thing about stories that we discovered in the data that we've seen over the last month is actually, let's have a look at the stories reach versus a post in a feeds reach. And for me, that's a really interesting thing to look at because we've been looking at slightly declining organic engagement throughout the course of this data. And we've also looked at some of the, the post formats that deliver the best results. So with that, however, we need to think about how stories fit into our mix, because if we're looking at trying to drive reach, i.e. get more people to see our content, then actually stories perform only about half as well um, as they do in the feed. So some really interesting kind of trends uh, that are emerging here that we need to think about and how we balance our strategy between feed and the story. And it's all depending, once again, back over, back down to what you want to achieve as an organization. If it's reach, if it's getting as many eyes on your posts as possible, or on your content, I should say, you know, stories potentially is not the way to do that, but it's great to drive a depth of engagement. So we just need to balance that up. So sticking with, with Instagram, I want to talk about hashtags because we see a lot of conflicting advice around this. And in fact, just at the Digital Marketing Summit, um, we were talking about this and saying that hashtags around seven is what we were seeing as the, the ones that drive the best performance from some data that we were looking at. Just going to show that, going to show that depending on how you look at data, you know, the answer can be very different. So I wanted to give a nice balanced view of this. So this is data from a company called Later, 
uh, they looked at 18 million posts, so pretty statistically significant. Looking at the number of hashtags to use per post to get you the maximum reach rate. Just as a reminder, what reach rate is, is the percentage of people that see your content as a percentage of your total followers. So if you have 100 followers and 50 see it, it's your reach rate at 50%. And it's concluding that 20 hashtags in that post will maximize your reach. So some really interesting things that can help us counteract some of the declining organic reach and help us maybe reorganize our strategies, thinking about how we might utilize stories, how we might utilize live streaming or things like carousel posts to help counteract some of the overarching decline in organic engagement that we've seen across the platforms. So moving on to paid trends. So paid's had a really interesting journey over the course of 2021. Lots of changes that have been driven through the iOS 14 updates. But irrespective, it hasn't stopped the appetite for money flowing into ads. Ad spend is up 43% year on year, massively significant. But it is coming at a, at a cost. And particularly, we see this ramping up towards the end of the year anyway, as there becomes lots of competition on social platforms for a share of that budget. But cost per click isn't coming down anytime soon. We see it continually go up. Slight corrections here and there, especially in January, because you know advertising budgets aren't as rich in January. So, but it's going to go up and up in the same way. There's a, there's a few truisms in social, right? So we know that organic reach is going to decline and we know that paid is going to get more expensive. It's just how it is. But that doesn't diminish how important social is to our strategy. But click through rates remaining pretty consistent, to be honest. But interestingly, talking about the iOS 14 update, uh, some bit of data that I saw over the last month around this is very interesting that the simple update that iOS did, or Apple did, um, to uh, mandate that, well, basically ask the question for anyone using any social platform, do you want this app to track you? Of course, that has significant downsides um, for the social platforms because the majority of people, I think about 96 or 97% of people have said, no, I don't want to be tracked. So of course, now when we're starting to target on social, we've lost a lot of that richness in data. So naturally, that's conf that has, um, uh, what's the word, that has it really impacted the, the increase of the advertising costs as well, because we can't get as targeted, we have to go more broad. So naturally, advertising costs have gone up. So it's impacted that. But this is quite interesting when we think about advertising strategy, actually, is where are the ads being placed? If we look at the different placements here, and we can see the cost per click and the relative spend. So here on uh, Facebook feed, the majority of the spend for social ads across Facebook and Insta are predominantly on your Facebook feed, right? I think we can all uh, agree with that. That's probably the most popular one that we'd always use as well, followed by the Instagram feed. But where, where it's very interesting is that where we see click-through rates particularly high for the Facebook feed, so it's, you know, it's good to see most budgets going there with the highest result, all good. But actually that chart inverts on itself, where actually IG feed is one of the worst performing than in-stream video um, is the bit that's doing the best. So, of course, you know, we're, we're looking at smaller data here. So it might be unrealistic, like click through rates are this high or continue to be this high if the spend ramped up. But it does give us, you know, pause for thought, actually, to think about, actually, should we really start reevaluating the placement of our ads or at least test a little bit more into 2022? It was my takeaway from that. And talking of testing, uh, usually on these sessions, I'm extolling the virtues of TikTok. But actually here in this instance, this was a experiment that someone ran. And I appreciate I need to give it some context because this experiment was you know, very much a controlled experiment by one individual with a thousand dollars on each platform and just measuring it. So that's quite a narrow experiment not hugely statistically significant, but I thought it was interesting enough to share nonetheless, is that if you look at TikTok versus Insta Reels, these were ads placed on those with a thousand dollar budget targeting the same demographics. Basically across all metrics, Instagram Reels ads are twice, nearly three times in some cases, better performing than TikTok. Goes to show the focus that Instagram have on their advertising product as opposed to, to Reels, as opposed to TikTok rather, but it also shows how keen Instagram is to, to promote Reels, get more people involved in it, uh, push Reels more heavily, which includes bringing advertisers to Reels. So this could be another thing to, to test out 
along with what we saw in the previous slide, looking at those different ad placements as well. So with the first 15 minutes taken up by all the data, those things hopefully get the synapses firing and thinking about your strategy moving forward. Let's look at it one by one. So firstly, uh, I had to change the logo on this slide because we're talking about the parent company here. So this is Meta. So um, what happened since the last time we spoke is that Facebook as a corporate entity are no longer called Facebook, called Meta, going after the metaverse. We don't have enough time to talk about the metaverse right now. Um, very, very interesting to see where this is all going to go, but we shall see. But then if we look about the updates, this is more of a kind of virtual signaling uh, PR move, if we're honest, which is Meta shutting down facial recognition, um, because naturally that's what we've all come to know and love with with Facebook when you get tagged in photos and recognizing your your face they're not doing that anymore and they're also offering new tools to help monetize content for creators this matters less for for public sector individuals but what it does mean actually for the audiences that are going to be created on Facebook um, means a lot because what we're going to see over the course of next year and this is very much a trend that's going to continue is the creator economy is with us to stay, which means there's going to be lots more communities created around certain individuals. And it's those community owners that we as organizations within the public sector and nonprofits, et cetera, we have an opportunity to work with to reach highly engaged communities. And I see much more opportunity in through this kind of method of advocacy and partnership than I do within ads. And I'd like to think that's really the future of social. Talking about those communities, we can talk about communities on Facebook about talking about Facebook groups. And what's happened since last time we spoke is that the Facebook Community Summit happened and there was a whole load of new stuff that came out of it for groups. We're going to fly through some of this now, but it just shows Facebook's um, reassuring level of investment that's going on into the groups at the moment. Um, groups are critical for Facebook's growth in the short term. There's 1.8 million, 1.8 billion groups on Facebook. So, you know, they're well utilized. So firstly, customization for groups, you can make it look much more on brand and related to your organization. Um, this is something that's really nice. You can award people for good contribution, fantastic way of um, encouraging the right behavior and also making people feel great to be part of the group. So there's some re rewards you can give to people that are you know, encouraging that, like I said, that good behavior, responding to things appropriately. Also, subgroups are happening for Facebook groups. So if anyone runs a large group, um, what can be really useful is separating that out in subgroups, which will be really useful, actually, for those that run like paid um, groups like uh, like Joanne does, for example. Those subgroups and being able to monetize those will be really interesting. Also, if let's say there is a, a Facebook group for a particular council like that subgroups can be set up for certain things regarding that council um, and it really just helps focus the conversation because things can get lost in facebook groups quite easily like i said you can monetize subgroups as well i'll gloss over that um because we don't need to know too much of it but um this will be important once again for for those creators that are building those communities and it's those communities and those creators we can work with as organizations to help distribute our messages Facebook groups also get chats and recurring events just to keep on driving that that interaction. Basically, it's integrated with Facebook Messenger now just because chat threads can get lost in Facebook groups. So they're making it more easy. Long form content is coming to Facebook groups. Once again, the objective to keep people um, on the platform longer reading, also giving group owners more opportunity. And, you know, Facebook groups also here to help kind of buy and sell products as well. It's linking to Facebook shops and Facebook marketplace as well. And live streaming is coming to Facebook and live stream shopping as well. Facebook groups, that is. So a huge amount of effort and emphasis has gone into Facebook groups, underlining the importance of groups for Facebook's future growth and also the importance of groups, you know, twofold for us as organizations. One, groups as a marketing tactic to use to encourage and build a community, but also secondly, to find other groups that we can work with to make friends with a group owner, build relationships and use them as, well, use them is the wrong word, but work with them uh, for advocacy of our products and mission or whatever we're trying to achieve. That for me is going to be the, the ultimate opportunity within groups. Um, really simple update sticking with Facebook um, feed posts can be shared to Instagram. So whenever you're creating a post on Facebook, you can also share it to Instagram cross platform sharing. So just made it a bit easier. Um, quick update. 
and this is definitely an FYI for everyone. Facebook released a new page experience. Um, and like with Facebook, with most things that they do, with the new things they roll out, it tends to be a bit buggy, it tends to be a bit a few problems with it. I've seen lots of reports around this where someone's upgraded their page um, to the new experience and they've lost previous content, lost their previous analytics, tried to switch back and that, that analytics and that content hasn't returned. My main takeaway from this is to try not try and avoid upgrading your Facebook page um, until the bugs have been worked out. I would kick that down the road till next year, to be honest. So you don't necessarily need to do it. There's a few things they brought in, but fundamentally, if you can avoid it, please do. On to Instagram. I really like this. This really encourages collaboration on Instagram. This is the add yours sticker. Very much playing on TikTok's viral success of their whole duets feature, which allows people to kind of make a parody or make a play on a previous piece of content, really ramps up the interaction on a piece of content. That's going to be another future trend we'll see going into next year, building content, not just to drive engagement in terms of likes and comments, but building content that allows people to do their own parody or take of it or adding yours. So, for example, in this example here, we've got a sticker with for Instagram. So you can do this now, which is called hashtag outfit of the day. So it's a very e-commerce environment or uh, example here where people can add theirs and we can see everyone that's added there. So it really helps take a piece of content and grows it bigger. Fantastic for collaboration, fantastic for engagement. Definitely excited about that one. Instagram has launched live stream shopping. You're going to see this once again, going back to that whole e-commerce thing that we started with and that growth of live streaming as well, capturing those two trends. All the platforms are getting on this. We can also now, in the same way that we could take our Facebook posts and share it on Instagram from Facebook, Instagram and Twitter are becoming friends again, which is nice. So if you have a, a Twitter link that we want to share on Instagram, we can we can do that. So, um, sorry, Instagram link we want to share on Twitter, we can do that. So before it looked really messy, but now we can do it. But to be honest, sharing link posts like this that we, we saw earlier uh, is still not the optimum way of working. But if you've got something on Instagram that's really good that you do want to share, you know, you can do that, but it's just not optimal. Um, this is another important one for accessibility. Um, Instagram are bringing in uh, to Reels text to speech. So that's really, really important. Accessibility of content, allowing more people to create content without necessarily needing to write, just do it with their voice. Onto Twitter, not too much happening here, but they've, they've grown from quarter to quarter, which is really encouraging. So all of the changes that happened at Twitter, particularly around audio spaces, um, is going really well. This thing I really like, small update, but for, for people that like a bit of research, this is a good one. So if there are any kind of influencers that, or people that you admire that you want to have a look at the content that they've done previously, rather than having to scroll through everything that they've done historically, we can just go ahead and press the search button and go ahead and find some content that they've created of which we might want to whole, you know, do another take on, we might want to reshare, et cetera, whatever, but we can find stuff better now. Twitter have also improved their analytics. This is available now within your analytics on Twitter. So they've made it a few more metrics, made it easier to use as well. And as we saw uh, just a moment ago with Instagram, Twitter have launched live stream e-commerce. It's happening across every single platform. Uh, LinkedIn, very small update, um, the marketplace. So this is probably less relevant for the public sector audience, but if you have services um, to offer on LinkedIn, you can now go ahead and list those services and they can be found on the LinkedIn marketplace. On to TikTok, the rapid growth that we spoke about right at the beginning, the growth of the Gen Z user base and also the growth of the user base across all the age demographics. Only about six weeks ago did uh, TikTok hit 1 billion monthly active users, but now they're on track to hit 1.5 billion in the first quarter of next year, which is frankly staggering. Uh, TikTok have also improved their advertising packages as well, helping um, kind of mature them in line with what you can get through all of the other social platforms to help capture email addresses and feed them through to a CRM. TikTok's creative exchange is going to be really important for us as organizations moving into next year. I mean, fundamentally, I speak lots about TikTok um, and I'm not a huge user myself, but as a from a business perspective, I've now gone past the point of 
you know, waiting and seeing whether it's going to to be something that stands the test of time. But I've waited and I've seen, I've seen enough, to be honest. There's so, it's too much opportunity to ignore now. This creative exchange is one of those. In the same way that I was speaking um, from a Facebook perspective about how we can work with uh, creators and community owners to help distribute our message, TikTok are, are acutely aware of that. And they've built tools to help you find those individuals to work with. And really, it's a, it's a community-led platform, TikTok. And the more that we can work with the community rather than thinking, oh, right, we're going to be on TikTok. We need to set up our brand profile and we need to, you know, what are we going to say on TikTok? We should be focusing around, you know, who are we going to work with on TikTok? Because that, for me, is, is the bigger opportunity. On to YouTube. Um, they've taken a leaf out of TikTok's rulebook, which um, they've launched this new to you feed, which is very much like the very popular TikTok for you feed, which algorithmically suggests things which are spookily accurate based on your own interests. So YouTube are taking that approach as well. YouTube are trying to combat um, a slight decline in usage which, I mean, they're still viewed by about 23 to 24 hours per month. So YouTube has still got incredible viewer statistics, but it's only TikTok that started to encroach on them recently. So they're trying to combat that. Also, a move that I like, this move was um, replicated by Instagram before, earlier this year, where they removed the like counts. But YouTube have still got the like count, but they've removed the dislike count, but they still kept the button. YouTube live stream e-commerce. You didn't expect that, did you? Like with every other platform, this is what they've done as well. Every single platform all over this at the moment. Oh, look, Pinterest is another one. Live stream e-commerce. Pinterest TV has launched all of it's about like getting creators, sending them live um, and allowing people to look at the products that are being used and shop them directly without leaving the feed. And talking about that, um, whole kind of e-commerce experience, Snapchat are on that, but they've taken it to a kind of a next level or rather than it being a next level, they're focusing less on live stream e-commerce and the transaction. They're focused more on like that user experience of trying on clothes. So this augmented reality allows people to try on certain looks to see uh, see what they think about it. And on to the final one, Clubhouse. Clubhouse is a tale of two sides on this one because on the one side, they've got some features that I feel that they've been missing since the launch about 18 months ago that I think finally makes Clubhouse a, a platform that is sustainable to use. For example, ability to pin links to a room, ability to have replays. This is a critical one. And you can also see everyone that's watched those replays as well. So people can go back into your room after you finish the live broadcast and they can listen to the replays. They can look at the pinned links. That's much better. And once again, for accessibility, live captions is here. All of that stuff was critical on day one of, of Clubhouse, really, because fundamentally, if you're going to build a content strategy around it, you need to be able to repurpose that content rather than it just being live in the moment. So having on demand, having links, having the, the automatic subtitles and the resulting transcription means that we can repurpose that blog, uh, that, that Clubhouse room or session as a podcast. We could take the, the, the transcript and write it as a blog. So we can repurpose to make it go further. We couldn't do that before. But the other side of the story with Clubhouse, however, is that latest data suggests they only have 6 million monthly active users. Now, in normal terms, that sounds like quite a lot. You know, I'd love it if Content Cal had 6 million monthly active users, but that's not the reality. So in the world of social, however, where you've got TikTok that are on the way to one and a half billion monthly active users. You've got even the smaller social platforms where Twitter is actually one of the smaller ones now, uh, where you've got about 500 million monthly active users. Clubhouse is with six millions, barely a dot. So I'm not saying it's irrelevant, but it's definitely worthwhile considering the overall impact of the platform, the potential reach when we consider Clubhouse as part of our strategy. So we need to be quite mindful of that. So don't, don't need to jump in because it's new. We, should, we shouldn't necessarily bring it into our 2022 strategy unless we have a really clear objective for it. So with that, you made it. So let's, let's go ahead and, and summarize some of what we've learned over the last half an hour, which is ad performance and strategies are, are not in alignment. Do we need a rethink of those? Fundamentally, where we are looking at the different ad placements and how TikTok and Reels ads were doing differently, 
now is an opportune time, opportune time to run a, run a few tests to evaluate with a small bit of budget what potentially is yielding the best. Maybe different ad placements on Facebook, placing in the, you know, putting on in-stream video, for example, or maybe experimenting with new platforms like TikTok as if it's a great way to dip your toe in the water with a platform, TikTok, for example, on the advertising side um, and similarly with Instagram Reels. We looked at the declining organic reach. So, of course, that is going to be an impact. It's a, it's a truism that we all face, declining organic reach on Facebook and Insta. I can't see a time where it's going to come back. So we need to reconsider the things we do to help counteract that overall decline in organic reach. Those things we can do is experimenting with different post formats, like looking at live video, looking at carousel posts, also looking at different platforms. For example, we know organic reach on TikTok is really strong at the moment, or as it is also on LinkedIn. Social commerce is driving social media direction. So you're going to see that continue into 2022. And as I've been talking all throughout this, that whole partnership with creators and communities, that will be another kind of 22, 2022 consistent trend. And with that, back to Joanne in the studio. Andy, thank you. What a way to wrap up uh, 2021 because our minds do move to 2022. And I think you kind of summed up very well with your opening statement where you kind of give us all that precursor to the session saying, you know, I'm going to give you a load of inf information, but you don't need to be everywhere. I actually think 2022 is about being very prescriptive about your channels and your tactics on those channels because it is, it's exploding. And one of the great things that I love from this session was even that mini example of the advertiser that spent the thousand euro on TikTok reels, TikTok and reels, and then compared it, compared it like the, it was, it's, it's quite expensive. Like the, the figures that you were even showing based on a $1,000 spend, it was still quite high. The cost of advertising is going up. Organic reach is going down. You kind of, you want to rethink your strategy. Like that's what you need to do because I think, we all rushed in in 2021, we had COVID, more people were spending time online, and I think we just wanted more visibility. But I think in 2022, we're gonna to have to kind of really lean back and say, you know, is it Facebook groups and subgroups, which is brilliant? Is it TikTok just for brand awareness? And should we lean into social audio for the authority voice? So, I'm kind of thinking that we need to be a little bit more discerning about our social because otherwise people are going to be drowning in the noise. Mm. Very, very true. Um, yeah, less lesser actions rather than more. And I would always recommend, however, a, a, a commitment to testing. And, mm. you know, whether that's 10 or 20% of your time, just just to use that kind of, we all get a bit curious sometimes and think, are we doing the right things? Just commit some budget or some time to testing um, because things will change all the time. Um, and I think that's that's a useful thing to do. But yeah, focusing on those those core things that have driven result into for you into 2021, cutting the things that haven't, um, and then just being curious and inquisitive about what are the other things that could whether it's different advertising things I mentioned or maybe putting in a different uh, platform into the mix. And actually, not just because we've got content, Carl, and you know, this is our collaboration, but actually I think where it might start in 2022 is really hammering out your content plan. You know, thinking about the stories, the audience, the pillar messages, and mapping out your plan. Because oftentimes I see it with my clients and you know, they're now willing to fully embrace social, but maybe they're playing catch up. I'm like, I can show you the how to of the platforms, but we really need to start back with your audience and your content plan. And like, now we have amazing opportunities. We've got audio on so many platforms. We've got short video on TikTok and Reels. Then we've got long form content now being introduced into Facebook groups. But all that can happen coming from a really great content plan and then yeah. just repurposing. Hundred percent, hundred percent, and that's that's always why I go to great pains to kind of explain that. Don't feel like you need to need to be everywhere. You've got choices now, and this this is what all of this does is provides us with more choice. So we can be like, right, if we're going to double down on an audio strategy, 
fine. So audio is going to be our thing, of which let's just say, for argument's sake, we'll do, do it on Twitter spaces. We'll take the recording of Twitter space, and then we'll go ahead and put that as a podcast. We're going to launch our podcast. And then we're going to take the transcript, because there's lots of cheap transcription software, uh, and check it out as a blog. And it's the same it's the same thing, right? It's the same thing repurposed multiple times. As long as your message is right, you're testing a different distribution. It doesn't have to be brand new content created each time. So, yeah, uh, well, I could speak for hours about that. And, of course, I would, of course, advocate your point of creating a plan. But, you know, I'm slightly biased here on my <laughs> on how passionate I am about creating a proper content plan. And you know what? I think we actually should need to do something in the new year around content planning. We might collaborate on a workshop if you were up for that. Um, because I get so many requests for train us on social media, train us on social media. But before I train them, I'm like, tell me, send me your content plan. And then I will train you with the with your content in mind. And so I think we need to go into 2022 with our content plan first. But one thing I'd like to ask you before we wrap up is, well, tell us about content, Cal, and that planning aspect that's built in, because it's it's a step to social media success. Oh, well, thank you. We're happy to do that. So, um, yeah, there, there really are two barriers that stop people from doing social media well from the time that I spent in doing this, which is uh, I don't have enough time to, to do it. And uh, I, I'm running out of ideas. I don't know what to say. And we, we try and address both of those by giving a single place where it allows a team even if it's just an individual but it works well with a team having everyone share ideas you know just clip things they find online if they have an idea on your phone just send that in it all goes into this little kind of content hub which is we call it the creative heart of content cow where you've got all of these ideas coming from things you say from across your business into one melting <laughs> And that gives you a whole load of inspiration. And that's that's a, that is the amazing thing about creativity. You just need a spark. Right. And that's as long as you've got all your spark in one place, that's going to help with your ideation. And then when you go to the calendar area, which is the final thing I'll say, when you look at your content plan all laid out with like we want to do these themes on these days, because hopefully we've got a thematic approach to our content plan. Right. So we want to do these themes on these days. These are the national days that are upcoming for the next quarter. And all we've got to do is marry the two together. We've got a load of ideas. We know what our structure looks like. Bring the two together. And then you've got it on one nice interface, which you can share with stakeholders and all that kind of stuff. So make it sound really simple, don't I? But, <laughs> but then you see you go to social with confidence and with the content really clear in your head. And then it's just about the features and how you present it. So, OK, let's commit to doing something in early 2022 for our shared audiences in public sector on content planning but for now andy it's been a pleasure thank you so much for collaborating with us at public mm -hmm. sector marketing institute this year it's been a blast i get the easy job you do the hard work i mean it's a win win <laughs> well, absolute pleasure no thank you for for working with, with me on this and we'll more to come next year brilliant thank you see you later take care bye bye Level up your social media skills by taking our diploma in social media, plus gain an industry qualification. Use the code SOCIALMEDIA20 for a 20% discount. Visit publicsectormarketingpros.com. If you want to ramp up your social media skills in 2022, then we are hosting our first ever live social media bootcamp. It's taking place over February and March, over five consecutive weeks. And each week we will focus on one of the core social networks. We've got Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and TikTok. Apart from learning the skills and the tactics that'll help you get maximum reach, I will also give you a mini social media plan for each social network. Also, I am giving you some free resources and this will tie into the whole social media theme. So why don't you start off the year before you join our boot camp with my free webinar. It's 2022 social media trends. So I'll be going in a little bit deeper into how you can maximize the trends on social media next year. Thank you so much for tuning into this show. You know, I always appreciate the feedback but do share with a public sector pro you know. For now, enjoy the podcast and I'll see you on the next episode. 
Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Public Sector Marketing Show. This episode has ended, but your digital journey can continue. Head over to publicsectormarketingpros.com to access resources and links mentioned in today's show and to connect with Joanne and her team. Until the next time, be sure to subscribe, rate and review on your favorite podcast platform. 